Our Father, that is our collective prayer. This morning as we come before your word, we ask that you would speak. We ask you as well that you would help us to listen. May we hear what you have to say to us. May we walk accordingly. God, we thank you for the immense treasure that your word is to us. And before it, we humbly sit and listen. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, this is the end. The end of Ecclesiastes. We have been walking together with Solomon through a description of the frustration, the vanity, the futility, the hevel of life under the sun. But here we discover that hevel does not get the last word. Solomon here gives us the last word. And to borrow an analogy, the ending of Ecclesiastes is something like the rudder that steers the whole ship. This conclusion does not change the subject in Ecclesiastes. It is, in fact, the subject of this whole book. And what Solomon does for us in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 9 to 14, is give us some insight into why he wrote. What was he aiming at? What was he driving us towards? And I want to read for us this ending of Ecclesiastes, this conclusion. Follow along with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. Solomon writes, In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also, sought, also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond these, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Why did Solomon write Ecclesiastes? I'm going to give us five reasons this morning that summarize this conclusion, that give insight into why Solomon wrote this great sermon book. The first reason we would point out comes from verses 9 and 10, and it is simply to record and compose God's truth. Why did Solomon write Ecclesiastes? To write part of the Bible, to record God's truth. Listen to the way Solomon describes his own process in writing Ecclesiastes. He says, in addition to being a wise man, speaking about himself, the preacher, that is, Solomon didn't see himself just as a wise guy in an ivory tower, but a proclaimer of his wisdom, he also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Solomon was not a man confined to his books, confined to his study. He wrote many proverbs. 1 Kings 4.32 says he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. But these ones are recorded and collected. And he tells us that he taught and pondered and searched and arranged these sayings. All of these verbs are in an intensive form in Hebrew. That is, he, he was very meticulous in all that he did. He pondered. That is, a, it involved a careful evaluation. He searched. He was thorough and diligent, and he arranged. That is, Solomon exercised skill in setting things in order. And notice in verse 10, he sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. We've seen many instances throughout the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon wrote things elegantly. This really is a literary masterpiece. Uh, there is beauty in the language which Solomon has written. And he also says he wrote words of truth correctly. 
You see, delightful words and true words are not mutually exclusive. We're tempted sometimes to think that pleasing words and truth don't go together. Jesus, of course, was the perfect model, the perfect exemplar of saying very difficult things beautifully. And throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we've seen Solomon do this very thing, couch difficult truths in elegant language. And God's Word is like that again and again. There is beauty and elegance and yet surgical, convicting precision in God's Word. Of course, we live in a culture that values many things over truth. Just tell me what I want to hear. Uh, Don't bring offense. Just say something that is pleasing to the ears. One writer has said that truth, when it is slightly valued, is easily lost. And unspeakably fearful is that loss. When you and I cease to value truth, we are already in the atmosphere of error. But notice what Solomon has done in Ecclesiastes. He has sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. But here Solomon is not speaking of truth generally, but truth specifically, God's truth. This becomes more clear in verse 11. But we get some insight in verses 9 and 10 into the Bible's doctrine of its own character, into inspiration. Uh, the fact that the Bible is the breathed-out Word of God. When we come to the Bible, we, we may ask, who wrote such and such a section? Well, we must always keep in mind two authors. There is a human author, and there is God, the capital A author of Scripture. And the human author, with all of his vocabulary, all of his writing style, and all of his experiences, writes... And yet God, superintending the human author, does so so that the human author composes without error God's very word. This is what Solomon has done in Ecclesiastes. This is what Peter writes about in 2 Peter 1.21. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But listen to this. Men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Who wrote Ecclesiastes, a man. But whose voice is it? Who is speaking? It is God. How does God do this? How does God superintend a sinful human being to compose His error-free Word? And Peter tells us, by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were to ask Solomon, why did he write? He would say, well, I, I pondered, I searched, I arranged, and I sought to find delightful words to convey truth correctly. That's Solomon's take on why and how he wrote Ecclesiastes. You could ask Luke, Luke, how did you write your gospel account? And he would say, well, I, I wanted to let Theophilus know what it is he needed to know about this Jesus. And so I researched. That's what Luke tells us about his own writings. You could ask John, John, why did you write? He said at the end of the Gospel of John, I wrote these things. There are many others I didn't write, but I wrote these so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, so that you may have eternal life. It's great when the human author gives us some insight into why and even how he has written. Solomon wasn't the only writer in the book of Proverbs. The other writers of Proverbs told us how and why they wrote. You can look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 23. These are the sayings of the wise. And in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 1, the words of Agur, the son of Jaca, the oracle. The author tells us these are his words. Proverbs 31.1, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. These are all the writers of Scripture speaking about their writing, their part in writing Scripture, but all of them superintended by God to bring us His Word. I believe we have a really surprising insight into the mechanics of inspiration right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon, meticulously diligent in studying out wisdom and composing and recording it. And it is definitely his style, definitely his experience, definitely his vocabulary. And yet it is God who is writing this. 
that Solomon wrote, number one, to convey to us God's truth. Secondly, Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes to bring us conviction and stability. Notice verse 11. He says, The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. Let's look at the end of the verse first. These are given by one shepherd. This is the first use of the word shepherd in Ecclesiastes, and Solomon is not talking about himself here. He's not talking about wise men who write wise things, which is in the plural in this verse. This one shepherd is singular. It's probably capitalized in your English translation, and the reason for that is this is a reference to God Himself. God has called the shepherd of His people in numerous places in the Old Testament. You might think of Psalm 23 and Psalm 80 and Ezekiel 34, Jeremiah 31 and Genesis 48. It's an amazing thing to think about the fact that our transcendent Creator is also our imminent or close-by shepherd. God is not just some distant watchmaker who set the universe going. No, He is the creator and sustainer of all things who meets us where we are and cares for us personally. It's a great picture of the character of our God. And here, the wise sayings of Ecclesiastes are said to be given by that one shepherd. These words in this book that we've been studying are not the meandering musings of some philosophical cynic. They are God's words, and they bear the weight of ultimate truth and divine authority. And let's look together how these words are characterized. Solomon says they are the words of wise men, again, given by one shepherd. There you see the dual authorship in the Bible. There are wise men writing, and yet they are given by God. And he says they are like goads. Like goads. What is a goad? An ox goad was a kind of a, a pointy thing you stuck into the side of your ox. It was a, a tool to prod sluggish cattle into action. It didn't cause them harm, but just enough discomfort to promote right behavior. And the words of these wise men given by God in Scripture are like goads. That is, they spur us on when we need to go and where we need to go and how we need to go. Now listen, if you have felt convicted at all in our journey through Ecclesiastes, then Ecclesiastes has accomplished some of its intended purpose. That's what these wise sayings are for. To promote some level of discomfort so that we stop going the wrong way and start going the right way. Further, Solomon characterizes these words as well-driven nails. And this word for nails was used of tent pegs, that is, a, an anchorage, a, a solid attach point to keep a tent steady in a storm. Uh, these wise sayings from God are, are designed to give us that stability. And the next phrase says that the masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. I think that the little phrase, masters of these collections, should probably be translated the collected sayings. The emphasis is not on someone who collects them, but on the sayings themselves. And if it is parallel to the goads of wise men, that is, the, the words of the wise men bring conviction, and the sayings that are collected, these wise sayings given by one shepherd, are, are designed to be like well-driven nails, then we see that God's words bring about conviction and a stability in life, a stability we so desperately need in a world that is broken and torn by the ravages of sin that suffers under the very curse of God that Solomon has been detailing for us in this book. There's a third reason Solomon has written Ecclesiastes. It comes in verse 12, and it is to narrow our search for truth to narrow our search for truth. If you were to set out in the beginning of your life and think, I need to find what's true, what's good, what's beautiful, and, and you had all the world before you to look around, you could spend countless, unending lifetimes looking. And what Solomon does is narrow our focus. If verse 11, Solomon was telling us to value wisdom because of the conviction that it brings and the stability that it brings, in verse 12, he wants to warn us against wearing ourselves out by searching for wisdom in all the wrong places. 
Look at verse 12. But beyond these, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. By the way, this is the theme verse for our church library. I don't know if you knew we have a church library. We do. Uh, Grace Bible Institute, the, the seminary on campus, as well as the church have a library. Uh, Lori Maxfield is the librarian, so if you want to find a good book, you can talk to Lori about that. Uh, you can also go to the book table. This uh, verse could be the theme over the book table if we wanted it to be. Uh, the writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. That's not going to sell many books at the book table. But there's a truth here we need to grapple with. It's a warning. It is a warning that the writing of many books is endless. You think about the great libraries of the world. Uh, the, the Royal Library at Alexandria, Egypt, contains some 400,000 volumes at its height. According to a Google search in 2010, in modern history, 129,864,880 books had been published in modern history. According to the website of the Library of Congress, they have 162 million items at the Library of Congress, 38.6 million cataloged books and other print materials in 470 languages, more than 70 million manuscripts, and the world's largest collection of legal materials, films, maps, sheet music, and sound recordings. Someone has said that a million new books are published every year. How many books did you read in 2016? You might be thinking, wow, we finally came to a verse in Ecclesiastes that is not convicting. I don't read books. <laughs> I watch TV. I read Twitter. Well, listen, you're not off the hook. The word for books here is an old Persian word that simply means writings, that which is written. It doesn't have to have a, a hard binding and, and be in sequential order. It's just words that have been recorded. And you and I live in the information age. You may not be a bookworm. You may have never seen the business end of a library. But you've been on websites, newspapers, blogs, emails, Facebook posts, and endless comments on Facebook posts, and the comments on the comments on Facebook posts. You've been exposed to screenplays for stage and movie and television, and all of these would fall under the category of writings. And the writing of them is endless. The devotion to this massive stream of information is wearying to the body. And, and notice the contrast here to verses 10 and 11. In verses 10 and 11, we discovered delightful words and truth that bring conviction and stability in life. But this other stuff, excessive devotion to all these other things is wearying to the body. That is, it will wear you out and it will not feed your soul, for the bulk of it does not lift your gaze to eternal realities. Consider all of the information out there and our culture's tendency to click and scroll endlessly, so addicted to finding out stuff, yet without wisdom, without discernment. How much of all of that uncountable pile of information is untrue or worthless? or even harmful. Too few people ask the question, what should I be reading? And instead of going out and finding the best book on a topic, people often settle for the latest one, the most popular one, the most awarded one. How much of what is written in our information age will be burned up as so much chaff and its authors and purveyors judged for their ponderous waste of God's time? and judged for their deadly perversion of God's truth. In verse 12, the New American Standard reads, but beyond this, and it makes it sound like Solomon is just saying, well, there's this, and then there's this, and then there's more, and there's more things I want to say. This isn't just another thing in the list of things Solomon wants to say. Your text should read, but beyond these. It is a plural pronoun in Hebrew. And what are the these? He's talking about the wise words that come from God through the authors of Scripture. 
Verse 12 is set in contrast to the Bible. What Solomon is saying here is beyond these wise words from God, people write all kinds of stuff. And the devotion to this trap of information is wearying to the body. It doesn't feed the soul. This is a contrast between God's Word and all the rest of the information that's out there. The corollary to this is the wise words that come from God are not wearying to the body. In fact, you can't be too devoted to those words, but excessive devotion to those other words will wear you out. Solomon can speak confidently in urging his own writing to the exclusion of all others because he knows that this is God's truth. This book, this sermon called Ecclesiastes, bears the authority of God and the integrity of God. And the New Testament writers expressed the same confidence, the same conviction in their own New Testament writings. In fact, the Bible's assessment of its own veracity and its own authority is all through the Scriptures. It would be arrogant for any of us to write something down and hold it up and say, thus saith the Lord. But the Bible does that. And Solomon is doing that here. See, the Bible is not one book in a sea of many, one truth claim in a world of competing claims. The, world, the Word of God is the only reliable source of information available. Solomon is not telling us to be illiterate, but he is warning us about the danger of a flood of misinformation overwhelming our senses about what is true and what is good and what is profitable. You and I ought to think in terms of the one who is giving this warning. Solomon spent his life and his resources and his talents exploring, searching for the meaning of life under the sun, and he exhausted himself in this search. And all the while, he could have looked up beyond the sun simply by looking down at his Bible. Don't repeat Solomon's mistake. You're not going to find something that he didn't find because it isn't there. The people who claim to be seekers of the truth with their Bibles closed always have questions, always seeking but never finding because they never arrive humbly under the source of all truth, the truth, God Himself. They may pride themselves in their so-called seeking but they will ever be frustrated by it, never satisfied, never finding, never landing somewhere. They're like the men Paul described in 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Have you considered the rhythms of your information intake? How often is your mind tethered by the well-driven pegs of the words of God? How often are you prodded by the goads of conviction in God's Word. Now, the world prizes open-mindedness. The book of Proverbs would tell us that the open-minded man is a fool, the guy with a flip-top head that without discernment, without filters, just lets everything in. You don't eat that way, and nor should you think that way. Listen to Proverbs 14, 15. The naive believes everything. The sensible man considers his steps. We must be aware of the rhythms of our information intake. We must be warned about the rhythms of our information intake. If we think that a petty, cursory glance at our Bible a few mornings per week can really stem the tsunami of bad information headed our way every day, we're mistaken. We need a regular, steady diet of God's Word. Do you know God's Word well enough to filter the flood of worthless and harmful data headed your direction? In verse 11, Solomon tells us to value wisdom. And in verse 12, Solomon warns us against wearing ourselves out by searching for wisdom in all the wrong places. Solomon narrows our search for the truth. It's why he wrote Ecclesiastes. There's a fourth reason on display in this conclusion for why Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, to drive us to fear God. To drive us to fear God. Look at verse 13. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is 
fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. And here Solomon gives his own theme to this great book. This statement governs all that has been said. It would be wrong for us to assess Ecclesiastes in a way that differs from its author's own stated purpose. And believe me, there are plenty of scholars who disagree with Solomon's conclusion about what Solomon wrote, which seems kind of silly. When the author tells us, this is what it's all about, this is why I wrote it, we should listen to him. And what is Solomon's stated purpose to drive us to this, to fear God, to obey God? Eternity set in the heart of man, chapter 3, was always meant to drive us to this conclusion. Frustration, vanity, hevel under the sun was always meant to drive us to this conclusion. And Solomon's sermon was always driving us to this conclusion. What does it mean to fear God and keep His commandments? Well, this is sort of an Old Testament way of saying, be in a right relationship to your Maker. Be in a right relationship with God. And this comes in two parts, fearing Him and obeying Him. And obedience flows out of the right kind of fear of God. What does it mean to fear God? It means to respond to Him appropriately. He is the Creator. I am a creature. He is holy. I am a sinner. To respond to God by fearing Him is to respond to Him in faith, in humility, in reverence, in obedience. Scripture ties the fear of the Lord to a number of really important ideas. I want to give you some of those. First of all, to trust and protection. Trust and protection. Listen to Psalm 115, verse 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. See, what is fear of the Lord? Faith. Entrusting yourself to Him. And what is the benefit of fear of the Lord? Protection. Protection from God. Also tied to fear of the Lord is forgiveness of sin. Listen to Psalm 130, verse 4. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. You see, fear of God isn't just what happens before you get forgiven. But forgiveness of sin brings you into a new kind of relationship with God where the fear of God, the right kind of fear of God, accurately describes your relationship to Him. Listen to how the fear of the Lord is tied to blessing and obedience. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord, says the psalmist. How blessed, how happy is the man who fears the Lord. How blessed and happy is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in His commandments. Their obedience to God's commandments and fear of the Lord are equated in synonymous parallelism. Uh, in Hebrew poetry, two things that are the same said back to back in a slightly different way. And the one who does that is blessed or happy. And we shouldn't think of fear of the Lord as some sort of uh, awful, cowering in the corner kind of thing. But a disposition of the heart that actually brings about happiness. How is the fear of the Lord related to evil? Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And the fear of the Lord is related to God's favor. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord favors those who fear Him, those who wait for His loving kindness, that great Old Testament word for grace. The Lord favors those who fear Him those who wait for His loving kindness. And this fear of the Lord is not just an Old Testament concept. You remember when Jesus calmed the storm, and the disciples were with Him in the boat, these uh, hardy fishermen types who had been around the sea their whole lives. The storm is terrifying. They, they are sure their boat is going to be swamped, and they're all going to drown. And when Jesus calms the storm, the Bible says, they were afraid. They were afraid more now with the storm calmed than they were when the boat was about to sink. Why? Because of something bigger and stronger and scarier than the storm that almost took their lives was in the boat with them. God was in the boat. 
This is the kind of fear that actually endears us to God. This isn't a fear that makes us run away. It's not a fear that says, I've got to get away from this God. But a fear that says, I must get close to Him. This kind of fear drives us in faith to the only one who can rescue us. Someone so big, so terrifying, so much stronger than everything else around, and yet that someone loves me personally, individually, with all of that terrifying power and awesome stature reinforcing that love, protecting, securing, keeping us to the very end. It's like taking that playground conversation to the infinite. Well, my dad can beat up your dad. The one who fears God has nothing else to fear. Charles Bridges wrote this, Here we walk with our Father humbly, acceptably, securely, looking at an offended God with terror, but at a reconciled God with reverential love. That's how he defined the fear of God. There's a second part to this fear of God, and it flows from the first part. Obedience. Notice what Solomon says. Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. The one who fears God, the one who submits to him in humble faith, the one who exercises that trust by obedience is the one who does what God says. It would be crazy to do otherwise. I want you to understand the relationship here of faith and fear and obedience. I will put my life in God's hands, entrusting myself entirely to Him. And that faith expresses itself in a desire and a readiness to do what He says. It is a faith that says, I trust God's way of doing things. Proverbs 28, 26 gives us the opposite. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. And you know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will straighten your paths. What kind of a faith is it that says, I trust you, God, to save me from the eternal consequences of my sins, but I don't trust your direction for my life here. I want to continue to go my own way. James, the New Testament author, tells us that that kind of so-called faith is a joke. Faith in God is actually manifested outwardly in obedience to God. A newfound desire and affection for God that manifests itself in obedience to His commands is actually an evidence of saving faith. Notice what Solomon says, because this applies to every person verse 13. Literally, this is all of the man. This is what it means to be a person. In other words, this is what life is all about. Fearing and obeying God is the great privilege and the great duty of every person who has ever lived. This is what life is about. And as we saw last week, we're, we're not to wait until we're on oxygen to get this straight. And many people remember him too late but nobody remembers him too soon. We should not think that fearing God and obeying Him is some human attempt at merit or a legalistic approach to God. It is rather a life of faith lived in reverential dependence upon Him. Here's Walt Kaiser's definition. It is a summary of the beginning, middle, and end of life as we know it on this earth coming to know and trust the living God, receiving the gifts of life's goods, learning how to enjoy those mundane gifts, understanding the major parts of the plan of God, and being guided into joyous and strenuous activity in the art of living, even while portions of life remain enigmatic. Of course, the most fundamental obedience to God is given to us in 1 John. 323, this is his commandment, John writes, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another. 
First and foremost, what does God command? (laughs) Be reconciled to me. There's a fifth reason Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes on display for us in verse 14. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, fifthly, to teach us that everything matters. To teach us that everything matters. Look at verse 14. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Ecclesiastes ends where the world ends, before the bar of God's justice. And you see, this rights every wrong. It unbends everything that was crooked. It fixes everything that was broken. You and I have been agents in a rebellion against God. We have all been perpetrators as well as victims of the system of which we are parts. All of it and all of us will on that day bow the knee to the adjudication of a righteous, all-knowing, ever-present, invincible judge. This is the final verdict. After all of the frustration, after all of the enigma, after all of the confusion, after all of the vanity, after all of the questioning, why is the world like this? It ends here. This is a final verdict, the vindication of God and the final rescue of His people. This is relief for those who have patiently waited through all the frustrations of life under the sun. But it is infinite trouble for those who have refused to fear God, who have neglected to come to Him in humble faith. Now, let's talk about this judgment for a moment. There is a negative side to it, and there is a positive side to this judgment. Notice what Solomon says about it. Every act God will bring to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Let's consider the negative side of this first. And I want to speak to you this morning, especially if you're not a Christian yet. If you've not yet had your sins forgiven, if you still walk in them, I want to read to you the most sobering 130 words ever penned. They come from Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And they are the description of the judgment that Solomon is referring to here. John the Apostle writes, Revelation 20, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What a terrifying day for all who on that day still stand in their sins. Paul tells us in Romans 2.9 that every evil deed will be judged. Jesus tells us in Matthew 12, 36, every careless word will be judged. Paul says in Romans 2, 16, the secrets of men's hearts will be on display. Paul tells us in Romans 2, 5, that men are there for their stubbornness and unrepentance. Jesus refers in Luke 12 to what we did with our time and talents and opportunities and relationships and resources. All of it assessed by God. All of it in those books. All of it on display. All of it to be punished. Every act of religious hypocrisy. Matthew 6, 2. And most importantly, people there are judged and assessed for what they have not done with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they have not believed. They have not turned to Him in simple faith, a recognition that I am a sinner, I need a Savior, and God graciously provided a Savior in His Son. You see, Jesus came to the earth for the express purpose of dying, in order to face the judgment of God, in order to absorb all of the condemnation, all of the anger, all of the fury, all of the wrath of God, aimed at every evil deed and every careless word and and every dark secret and every stubborn and unrepentant heart and, and every failure to give God the best of your time and talents and resources and abilities. For everyone who would believe, Jesus would absorb all of the wrath of God for our crimes. And you know, in all of Scripture, Jesus Himself is the one who spoke most about this lake of fire, about hell, about fire and brimstone, about God's coming judgment. And it's right that the one who was judged for sin which so kindly warn us about the judgment that is to come for all who will not believe. You who are here this morning and have not yet surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are still breathing. There is still yet time for you to turn and have life. And listen, eternity is at stake in this. I don't know if you've done the math on forever, but it's a long time. Let's consider the positive side of the judgment Solomon describes here. In verse 12, Solomon says, God will bring every act to judgment, whether it is hidden, whether it is good or evil. To you who are Christians, I would say that this is a most neglected doctrine in, your, in our Bibles, the doctrine of rewards. I don't hear people talk about this a lot, and, and yet it's all over Scripture. If you wanted a discovery project for 2017, as you're reading through your Bible in a year, you might just look for the depiction of God promising rewards on the basis of faithful obedience to believers. It's all over your Bible. Now, to be very clear, we must remind ourselves that the way into heaven is not by obedience. Why? Because we don't have it in us. We could never obey God. We could never keep His commandments on our own. It is not inherent to man's fallen nature to be pleasing to God. And yet for the believer, to the ones who have turned to God on the basis of faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone, only Jesus' death in our place could earn our way into heaven. We've only earned a ticket to hell. But for all who have believed in Jesus, we are new creatures with our sins paid for, forgiveness purchased. We have new desires, new abilities we never had before we were believers in Jesus Christ. And so now we want to obey God, and we can obey God. We have an ability to be pleasing to Him. Paul even says in 2 Corinthians 5, we make it our ambition to be pleasing to Him. To contrast that to Paul's old life outside of Christ when he was a religious hypocrite and all he ever did was a pile of refuse before God. But as a believer, we want to obey Him. And God promises rewards for that obedience. What is the judgment like for believers? Well, listen to Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, believer? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Every evil deed, every careless word, every awful secret, every stubbornness and unrepentance, everything that you did with your time and talents and opportunities and relationships and resources, every failure, every transgression, every foul motive, every vile thought, paid for. Paid for in full by Jesus. It has been judged already at the cross. The condemnation has already happened, and there is nothing left in the wrath of God for you, believer. Not an ounce So how are Christians to be assessed by God at the end of time? 
for the fruits of their faith manifested in obedience to God while on the earth. Rewards for obedience. This is positive assessment. You can turn with me, if you like, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There in verses 10 to 15 of 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul describes this judgment, this assessment, this evaluation. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward." If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You see, this evaluation is not about salvation. It's not about whether or not people have eternal life. This is an evaluation of those who have eternal life, and it is an evaluation of their works revealed by fire. By the way, I used to think this was a, a scary passage because I know my life has had a bunch of wood and hay and straw uh, that, that I've been building my life with. And, and, and I hope that there's been something precious that will stand the test. And I thought, oh, what's it going to be like to, to have all the things that I've done just burned up in front of me? I praise God that I'm saved. This passage isn't scary to me anymore. All that wood and hay and stubble, the stuff not fit for heaven is the stuff that I contributed. It's the stuff that didn't please God. It, it was the, the time wasted and opportunities squandered and, and, and wrong motives and, and all of those things that went along with faithful obedience in this mixed situation that I find myself in. And, and praise God, I didn't want to take that stuff in there. And so God dispenses with it. And He rewards what remains. Scott read it earlier in Hebrews 13 that God is the one working in us. We're obeying, we're working, but God is the one doing it. So what are we saying here? That, that what remains is that which God produced. And we just have to stop at this amazing reality. God burns up all the stuff that just came from us and was worthless. But he rewards where faith and a yielded will produced fruit that lasts. The kind of things that only God can do. And so God is willing to reward what God produced in us. We should stand there at that judgment and say, God, why are you rewarding me for the things that you did in and through me? <laughs> because from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Amen. Amen. It pleases God to be gracious and to give and to give and to give. This is the kind of God we serve. In spite of who we are, God produces in us good works that we may walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. And then He turns around and rewards us for those very things He produced. Every cup of cold water given in Jesus' name, noticed by God and rewarded. Every time you've given in secret, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Every time you've prayed in secret, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Every time you've fasted in secret, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Nothing goes unnoticed. Nothing goes unassessed. Nothing in this frustrating, complex, enigmatic, troubling world goes unnoticed by our Father. Every time a stay-at-home mom performs routine, seemingly mundane tasks for the glory of God, noticed and rewarded in eternity. Every time a student works hard on an assignment, treating it as worship before God, turns it in, and the teacher may give him a bad grade or the same grade as everybody else who's not worshiping, <laughs> noticed by God and rewarded in eternity. When a man goes to work and builds widgets as worship, one day those widgets will burn up with the rest of the created universe, but the worship remains. 
noticed by God and rewarded in eternity. Every act of obedience, every act of worship, the spiritual fruits of spiritual labors. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. Even trials, well endured, produce reward. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4.17, light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. If you've been tempted to think that nothing in life matters, perhaps if a shallow reading of Ecclesiastes has led you to think that nothing matters, if the frustrations in a broken world have tempted you to conclude with your hands thrown up in disgust that nothing really matters, then you have missed Solomon's point. And you're in danger of missing the entire point of life. Solomon has been driving us to the very opposite conclusion, and it's displayed here in the last verse Everything matters. Absolutely everything matters. That's what God's final judgment means. Everything got noticed. Everything gets assessed. And it is judged or rewarded accordingly. The saying goodbye to Ecclesiastes is something like saying goodbye to a friend. And if we have listened... If we have heeded this sermon called Ecclesiastes, then Solomon has prepared us well to behold our God. Let's pray. God, we want nothing more than to be ready for eternity. To behold you, to see you face to face, to be clothed not in our own righteousness, which would only bring condemnation, but to be clothed in the righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who purchased it for us at the cross. We receive that by faith alone. It is your gift by your grace. Oh God, prepare us for eternity by giving us aid to walk in faith, a yielded will, surrendered to you, eager to walk in the good works you prepared for us. Oh God, teach us to fear you and to keep your commandments. That is what life is about.